Welcome to Critical Cafe. Join us as we chat about the latest episode, the campaign as a whole, and Critical Role in general. All while we partake in a delicious cup of coffee. So grab yourself a tasty beverage, settle into your favorite cozy spot, and get ready for a little geek philosophy. Welcome to Critical Cafe Live. Uh, my name is Brian, and with me, as always, is Crystal. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Uh, oh, and we're on. My light just at a, Oh, man. <laughs> this is just the way it's going to go. Maybe it was <laughs> someone reaching through from beyond messing with your light. <laughs> um, we're on a, an extra day this week. Uh, we wanted to uh, get caught up on the latest happenings over at Critical Role. And uh, so we'll be on again tomorrow. Um, and as the arm goes across the can. Sorry. And then it's okay. Back. Maybe okay. it'll stay. We're good. That's all right. I was just shiny things. I got distracted. <laughs> um, so, so we'll be on tonight and tomorrow. So uh, if you're watching uh, this live, welcome. Uh, welcome and join us in the chat if you'd like. Um, if you're catching us for the first time uh, or watching this uh, after it is uh, already recorded, we talk about all things Critical Role. We normally uh, are talking about Campaign 3 of Critical Role, but since the Critical Role crew has just released their new game, uh, both uh, the system and the new game around it, uh, Candela Obscura, we thought it would be a great time to kind of kick off some discussion about this new system, the new game, what we think about it. We're not going to get into too much detail about the first uh, session that aired uh, at the time of this recording, it aired last week. Um, we will cover that, but we always try to wait until uh, Critical Role releases whatever their version is to the public on YouTube. So they're, they have their live broadcast, but then they usually do it the week after. It's a little bit different for this one, so we're just going to wait until they put out the recording so that we can comment specifically about the story and all that stuff. So no, no spoilers, just our initial thoughts about uh, Candela Obscura and I'm actually going to share and pull up the screen and we'll look through the quick start guide today to kind of get a feel for the system and the game and and get everybody um, you know up to speed with what we've got so far. The quick start guide is free to download. You can go over to uh, their site and uh, download it yourself and take a look um, you know later to make sure that you're able to keep up with everything that they've got going. Um, but yeah, that's kind of what our plan is for tonight. Uh, I see a few people in the chat, or at least one person in the chat, and probably others joining. So, um, and uh, good evening from Florida. Good evening to you as well. <laughs> yeah, right back at you. Uh, and yes. so, yeah, uh, so uh, maybe we should just first start before we even look at the quick start guide. Is um, Crystal, what are your thoughts just on the feel and just the presentation and everything? for Candela Obscura just in general? What were your thoughts about it before we even jump into taking a look? So I am not a big horror fan. And by not a big, I mean not at all. Mm -hmm. I can do uh, fantasy, heavy fantasy and gore, but I'm not a huge like, you know, just straight up horror. I, I'm not a big like jump scene girl. I scream, you know, so um, I, I was a little apprehensive going into it, just knowing it's kind of got that like gothic y, horror y kind of, you know, edge to it. Um, but it was good, you know. I mean, I, it isn't quite as scary watching it in a DD &D game or, you know, in a role play game, I guess, perspective than it is. A television show or a TV show where they've orchestrated all the visuals to scare the crap out of you. So you know it's it was it, it's the right amount that I'm not sitting there with the pillow. You know, like <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. It's like you, you get the feel for it. You don't you know where they're going, but because you don't have all of that like blatant in your face. To me, it's almost like yeah. It's, I think it's closer to reading a book or listening to an audiobook that might be really scary or, or that yes. genre rather than watching a movie, even though everything yeah. looked great. The set was great. Uh, oh, all it was the cast gorgeous. Last week. It, we'll get into it more when we actually review yeah. it. But, you know, you, if you've seen the pictures, the cast was dressed up uh, during this one as well. And I think they yeah, can do they're... that more because th 
these are going to be monthly as far as I can tell. Like they're not a weekly show. Um, it's more of a short form game. So it's not huge year long arcs. I think it's a shorter arc for the campaign. So that way that you can, you know, switch out the groups and play different stories and things like that. So, right. um, yeah, I like all of the characters. Um, I think, um, I like the fact that it feels very role play heavy too, you know? Um, yeah. and I know it's first, first season, first episode of the new thing. So there's a lot more role play maybe like involved at the very front, but I, I still feel like there was a lot of really good, you know, meaty role play that happened. And, um, I, like I said, there's four characters. I like them all. And, um, I'm excited to kind of see what what happens the new uh mechanics are going to take some getting used to but overall the story sounds really cool you know matt's of course a genius and he's doing his thing and then everybody is really really into the role playing of it which i love so i, I agree with everything you said i think um one of the things that's going to be nice about this is i have a feeling that the cast will come in and out like it'll shift all the time after certain segments. I don't know that for a fact, but I think that this is one of those games where they could do that without having to worry about it. They they obviously bring other people in uh, and we'll get to that tomorrow when we talk about the campaign three game. They yeah. obviously bring other players in, but I think this is sort of designed for that. So speaking of, let's jump over and take a look at the guide and, and start, okay. um, you know, just seeing what we got here. So I think one of the, one of the things that is great about this is just knowing that they're, in their own system like this is their game their mechanics right. their rules it's not another system which i think is great uh it's a great way to highlight the system that they have produced is to be able to play it on their you know on their show um so in addition to kind of you know the credits and everybody that worked on it which you should definitely check out there's a lot of great people working on this but um just to you know talk about getting started in this whole realm. Um, so there's two things that were kind of released at around the same time, right? So really Candela Obscura is the game uh, itself with the setting and all of the things around it and the feel for it. But the rules behind it, the system that they're using is their own system called Illuminated Worlds. So one of the things that really struck me about this is they could come up with all kinds of different games beyond Candela Obscura that use the same system. Um, and I think that's, it's kind of a fun way to think about it, but for this one in general, uh, and you'll see if you go check this out yourself, but um, it is a horror uh, tabletop role-playing game uh, about a group of occult investigators who are hunting down dangerous supernatural forces and making incursions into the world and they've kind of set it much like ours in the turn of the century 1900s. Same level of technology, it seems like. Same type of dress, same type of uh, feel. Uh, and so it is a fantasy world. Um, and so you kind of get the feeling of, of what that's like. Um, the way that uh, this kind of works is that it's the name of this parent, the Candela Obscura, is the organization which the players, when you're playing, you're part of a group and you're also a part of the secret organization that is basically in charge of protecting the realm. And it's a city of New Fair and it's built on the ruins of an ancient fallen civilization. Um, and there's remnants of all this powerful magic uh, with a K uh, in this, which gives you a feel for like how they're going with this. Um, and so they are kind of... Um, seeing how things creep into society and dealing with all of the the elements of of that kind of stuff and because of that one thing i really respect that they did is they put some content warnings right at the beginning they say look this uh this game is is sort of a horror theme it's got um elements of body horror human cruelty violence death supernatural uh activity that all kind of goes around with that so if any of those things, you know, trigger you, then, you know, you just be aware of that. Um, but they also, which I am a big proponent of, if you're running any type of game, have your session zero and cover your lines and veils, the X card, open door policy, all of the things that are safety tools for the people at the table. So if things get out of control or beyond what someone's comfortable with, 
you can kind of uh, um, you know halt those things before they get too uh, too big. So even just this guide in in that aspect, I think, is good for people to take a look at. So I, I don't want to spend too much time on that, but um, let me start here, uh, and then we'll I'll, I'll stop after this so that we can kind of check the chat. We can chat a little bit about it, but. The rules. So there are three basic sections of rules. One is the rules of the world. Um, and this is that it kind of resembles a world like ours. The average citizen doesn't really know about magic or believe in magic or any of the things going on with it. Um, there's a barrier known as the flare. And this is sort of uh, the, the thin barrier between our realm and the world beyond. And there are places where that flare is weakened, and those are referred to as thinnings. And the thinnings allow metaphysical energy, and um, which is the magic of this realm, to kind of come through and seep into the world. And all of the myths and leg legends and the folk tales um, sort of explain all of the things that kind of seep in and out of the world. Like those are the legends that come from. Uh, the fact that there is this um, this flare that is uh, the barrier between everything. Then you have the rules of magic, which uh, magic can be um, infused into objects. It can be in places. It can also be in beings, and it can permanently alter them. So uh, if something is, if the, the thinning is opened wide, creatures from the other realm can come through. Um, and anything or anyone affected by the magic uh, is sort of known as uh, being um, affected by this phenomenon, right? So this means that they may take bleed, which is what they call it, and we'll see that later in the rules, which means that when a person has too much bleed uh, effect of all these uh, supernatural forces, they can be taken over by the supernatural forces, they can become corrupted, or they can die. And the manifestation of the bleed varies based on the type of stuff that's going on and how it's being affected. People with inherent magic um, are rare, but um, many of the Candela Obscura members interact with magic wielding artifacts and all kinds of things, and they may sort of help reduce the effect of the bleed on people. Final category, and then we'll we'll start talking about all this stuff, is the rules of Candela Obscura. So this is the organization part. So they're investigators of all that supernatural stuff, and they're trying to protect the world. There's a hierarchy within the organization. So you have a council of what are called light keepers who direct the resources and make sure that they can fund the missions and give people what they need to to be successful as far as the groups go. And then there's a the group that's sent out by the light keeper to investigate is known as a circle. So the people playing the game, the players at the table are going to be a part of their, they're forming a circle as they're playing. Um, all the missions are assignments, makes sense. Um, then there are chapters and local enclaves of members. So like there's sub organizations. So you might have, a Candela Obscura chapter that's led by, I assume, a, um, a specific light keeper who then has several circles working for them, right? So it's an organizational structure. Um, each, uh, and, and oh, and also there is uh, all these local enclaves, each has access to a thinning to the organization's transdimensional vault known as the Fourth Pharaohs. So the Forced Pharaohs is the fourth iteration of a lighthouse stronghold that sits within the flare. So inside, these are where all of the vaults, um, where the powerful books and artifacts and all this phenomena are kept for safety. They're like locking it away, keeping it safe, keeping watch over it. And then they're maintaining this uh, by, uh, or they maintain the security by constantly turning these magical astrolabes to like keep things uh, in this state of security while they're going through. So this is the basics of like the kind of the feel of the world, the rules and all that kind of stuff. So let's pause. That's a lot of information. So let's pause there for a second. And uh, yeah, let's, let's chat, shall we? Um, so 
I know there was a bunch of stuff. So what are your impressions like to start with about all that stuff? I mean, we watched the show, but now it's kind of laid out a little bit for us. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, I think it's really cool that as it is, magic is not inherently born. It's more, you know, there are people that that happens with, but it's very rare. So a lot of what you see when you're interacting, they've got all these gadgets and gizmos and they've got, um, you know, if somebody does have magic, it's definitely not commonplace. And it could be because they have what we've talked about, they've interacted with a flare or the the thinning and they've been they've taken some form of permanent change or something maybe mm. you know like that will be interesting to see if it can imbue like you like i said it can imbue objects it can imbue people it can be you know like so you might not be born with it but you interact with certain things enough maybe you can then gain magic um which is which is cool um i like how they've set up the world it sounds really it's like a mismatch of things, you know, it's like in the, in the fantasy genre, it's this like Victorian esque, but kind of almost like the rifts in, um, dragon age, you know, like where there's just these thinning areas and these things can come through, which is really, you know, really cool. Um, and then you've just got, you're also not really steampunk because it's not steampunk but it's yep. gadgety, you know, like, so I, yeah, I, I really like how the world, stuff, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I like how the yeah. world has, is set up and how it's described. And then, um, all of the, I'm really interested to find out a lot of the history because it's this, the city is now on top of old ancient ruins and, and how that comes into play with the game, especially after seeing the first, like episode so i agree yeah and, and it is it is good to to uh point out though that um because this is still early they're still this is a quick start guide um they're going to be play testing this at gen con so things may change like in this you know so this is just the first iteration i think it's a really good first iteration but yeah like i, oh, yeah. I think it's a good point you make like it's different from um it's not D and D it's not fifth edition, whatever mm -hmm. version you're playing. Um, it's a different right. game. And those that have been playing different role-playing games uh, may really see some, I, I see some correlations to this and some other systems as well. But if you've only played D and D or fifth edition or something like that, um, it may just feel different. Like, you know, just like the, you said, people don't have magic, you know, like, it's like, what do you mean you have magic? What if I want to play a wizard? I well, know. It's not really a I was like, what are these game. characters? Who are yeah. these people? What do they do? <laughs> it's a completely different system, right? Like, so. Um, yeah, yeah. But I think it's cool because of that, right? Like, it shows some variety in what you can do from a role playing perspective, yeah. uh, which I think is really cool. I also love the fact that, like, um, the way they have it set up is like, you've got um this light keeper and then you've got circles so it's built into the lore of the game that the people sitting at the table playing are that circle so like it's yeah. it immediately makes you feel like oh this is i'm i'm our group is this We're, rather than for example in a traditional fantasy game like D, &D um, which there's nothing wrong with that i love it um but like you have to figure out why is this group together um, you know, why are they sticking together? What's their goal? Nope. In this game, it's laid out for you. You are yes. part of this group. You are part of this circle. You are we hunting are down missions. or seeking out. Yep. Yeah. Like it's just yep. assignments. So I love that because it makes it easier to get going and start playing. Um, and, and it's like you mentioned, I think at the beginning, it's very role play story focused, which I think is also, um, yeah. it's fun. I think it's, it seems like a fun game to play. Yes. So let's jump in now that we've kind of got the rules. I think this is where, and, and we may break this up a little bit because um, we're going to get into the mechanics a little bit. If you have, for some of you uh, who have used uh, other systems that use dice pools, um, this will be familiar. Um, one that comes to mind right off the bat 
we did a review or I did a review on the channel of uh, Blades in the Dark. This seems very similar to Blades in the Dark. If you want to check out that video, I'll yeah. link it somewhere. Um, but yeah, it, it feels like similar in concept and like in the fact that like it's a group trying to achieve something, but also the mechanics are very similar. Uh, there, are, there are differences though. So let's, let's talk about, it. so we've got, like we talked about your do, you have a series of assignments that are given out by the light keeper um, who is played by the game master, right? So the game master is, is playing the light keeper and handing out the assignments, which is perfect. Um, and it's a mystery that should last between one and three sessions. So this is why I say this is a short form type of content because uh, this means like three episodes of Critical Role and they're done with this assignment, right? Like if they if they do it that way, maybe it's done in two, but probably it'll be three. And then they can move on to the we next can have another circle. circle. Right. Uh, so it's really, really great for this short form content. Um, all player characters uh, need one of the, in this case, this uh, quick start doesn't have all the rules for creating characters, but it does provide some uh, pre-generated characters. Um, which uh, are available for download along with this, which is great. It's a six-sided dice pool system, so you need at least nine six-siders. You don't need any other fancy dice, so if you've got D6s around, you can play this game, um, although we've got plenty in the other wall in Crystal's room. We've got plenty of all types of sizes of dice uh, available. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's 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 cool. Um, you'll need a... Also, which is great, you have a character sheet in this system, but you also have... Actually, let me pull it up. So you have... Um, I'll pull up the pregen. So here is what the character sheet looks like. We'll get into why it looks like this as we look at the rules a little bit more. But um, you can kind of tell, like... Hey, it's got your name, your style, pronouns, catalyst, circle, and your question you're trying to answer. It's got your uh, nerve, cunning, and intuition blocks, and then the subcategories underneath those. Your role, you could call that your class. If you're a 5e person, your specialty, you could call that your subclass, basically. And then you've got some things on it underneath. We'll get into those things. You've got marks. This is sort of like uh, an equivalent to hit points, so to speak. Um, you've got some place for your relationship and gears, and this is it. If you understand how to use the things on this, you understand how to play the game, which is pretty great. Like if it's, it's a pretty light, uh, you know, not a very rules dense type game. It's very story, story driven. It can be a challenge to learn it if you're not used to it. But I think if you play it, um, it's, it's easier. Like the more you play the, it comes really fast. You don't have to go through hours and hours of play before you get there. So let's, let's talk about how the dice work. So, um, it uses illuminated worlds. Again, that's the underlying system that they have, um, is a six dice, uh, or a D six dice pool system. Um, so anytime there is a question of something that may or may not happen, you're trying to do something, there's potential consequence if you don't do it right like there's a, a challenge involved then the dm may call for a roll and so you roll a certain number of dice depending on what you have available to you and all of those come into play depending on your character uh, and if any of the dice pop up with a six i'll skip down to that uh, you have a full success if you get more than one six out of the dice there, then you have a critical success. You get what you want, but something else, something extra comes into play. So getting more than one six is great. Uh, a six gives you full success. You don't have any big consequences to that. If you get a four or a five, and that's the highest you got there, then you have a success, but it's sort of mixed. You uh, have some type of a drawback included with being able to do that. Um, and then if you get just one, one to three, it's a failure and you don't accomplish uh, what you wanted and there are consequences to that. That's it. And the players roll this. Um, dice are added to this pool uh, based on different abilities and things like that. Um, and so the one thing I want you to notice here is, is it doesn't say... Um, you know, the GM rolling dice. The GM doesn't. As far as I can tell in this system, the GM is setting the circumstance. The dice are rolled by the players. 
and then everybody talks through and explains the result. So if you get a six, then the GM may say, oh, you, great, this is what happens, blah, blah, blah. If you get a five, it says, well, you did it, but, and then that happens. And then there's other times where, um, you know, you might have to have some type of uh, discussion or maybe the GM asks you, hey, what do you think uh, happens at this point? But it's not like, it, whereas in D&D or 5e or other games or even Pathfinder, you're rolling against a monster and the DM is rolling theirs and who wins. This is more, the dice are what the dice are. So you, there's it's not just, even- You rolled a one. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Which you this makes it very <laughs> light and easy, right? Like if as a, yeah. as a dungeon master I, or, a, or a game master, I don't have to think up what's the difficulty class need to be. What's the armor class need to be. I don't need to do that. Right. I just know if you succeed, if you don't succeed, or if it's somewhere in the middle, um, which is pretty great. There are some actions. Uh, we looked at the, uh, kind of got a uh, um, sneak preview of the character sheet there, but you've got actions that uh, you're proficient with. So um, you have a rating between one and three on those actions. So that tells you how many dice you roll when you try to perform that action. So yeah, this is bubbled in with a one, uh, you get a dice. You bubbled in with two, uh, you get two dice. Everybody can try something. So even if you don't have any bubbled in, you can always try it, but when you do, you have to roll two dice and take the lower. So it's kind of like rolling disadvantage if you try something that you don't have any points in. So there's at least a chance that something good can happen, right? So, <laughs> which I think is great. Like that's kind of real worldish to me. Like anybody can try to do something. Um, so yeah, so it's it's a, it's a good example here. They give you an example of the check. Danny wants to check the room to see if anyone in the crowd is closely watching her circle. Uh, the GM tells her to make a survey roll. She has an action rating of one in survey, so she rolls one dice or one die. And and that's kind of how that works. So that's really the, the basics of how that goes. Um, let me pause there. We'll go, actually, or let me see what's coming up next. We'll talk about drives in a second. Let's pause there. We'll go over to chat. We've got some stuff. So, yeah. So... We just broke my roommate's campaign during the last session, so unless he figures out a way to rein us back in, we might be ready to start doing <laughs> something in new weeks. I have to check this. Yeah, yeah. No, this is it's it's a it's a fun. So you could start right away. Um, one of the things that I won't cover today, or we won't cover today, it, because I don't want to spoil anything. But the quick start comes with an included adventure, so you guys can hit the ground running if you want to switch over and play this. So. Um, yeah, awesome. All right, so yeah, and I know you like your horror stuff. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <Mary>. exactly. <laughs> yeah, so um, so Crystal, thoughts about the dice pool system? I know we won't get into the specifics about like what we saw during the game again until we yes. they release it. But um, is it easier? Well, let me just ask: Did it make sense to you when you watched them play it, or does it make more sense now after reading it, or is it about the same? It made sense watching them play. Um, I just, um, I, I struggle with the whole just rolling sixes, you know, like <laughs> it, it just seems odd to me because, you yeah. know, I love all my dice and whatnot, but it, I don't know. I feel like there's so many, like there's so much less chance, you know, there's like, you know, like there's such a small margin of something being a complete success in my mind with the I, I six think... siders that's a it's a good point so like um you're you're looking for a six on a six-sided die every time although you got a five percent chance on a 20 of getting a, a critical right like on if you roll a d yeah d20 yeah but you got a five well and i think it's all of them, right? so. it, yeah, it's also important to state for people who are like me like i've only played 5e um that when you're rolling the sixes you're taking the t you know you're taking just the number on the top of each dice you're not adding anything together yeah. You're literally like, oh, no, I rolled four ones, you know, like, oh, no, I rolled two ones and three, a three and a five, you know, so you're taking the highest one unless you're trying to do something that you aren't proficient or good in or have a yeah. skill in. And then if you do that, like you said, you roll, you can roll two, but you take the lower one. So you're yep. really taking a risk then because you don't even have you know, a, a large, the, the more dice you can have for the roll, the better because yeah. it, oh, it ups your chance to get a success. 
So that's really what I kind of took from it the other night when we were watching it is, is you really want to lean into the things that you're good at. It, I think it might help like that whole main character issue that happens sometimes yes, when you're yeah. playing 5e because there's only a handful of things that your character is really good at. And that amounts to how many dice you get to do those things, which I think is great because um, you'll definitely have more defined roles instead of there being a lot of overlap or somebody max minning their character to, you know, do whatever. And, you know, like it, it just really, it's a little yeah. bit more natural. Yep. And it seems so funny you mentioned that. Like, I almost felt like there's like, again, we don't know the complete system yet, but for what, for how this works, it's really hard to min max a character. Like everybody, yes. you, you can only just like, because there aren't any only have numbers a that you're adding or <laughs> just if you're right. either good at it and you add more dice or you're not so good right. or you, you're not as good at like you do less dice. So it's only the number of dice that change, not adding any, uh, anything to it. So yeah, like, right. um, so let me, so yeah, so Harry, yeah, we're love, this is very Lovecraftian. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. If you are uh, a fan of those type of uh, books or even, um, you know, Call of Cthulhu as a game and things like that. This is definitely up your alley. Um, uh, time for work. Going to finish watching this tomorrow. Oh, thanks, guys. <laughs> Appreciate it. Have a good night, Harry. Um, so, yeah. So, I, I really like... So, but let's jump back over because one of the things you said um, really struck home, too. So, the other thing is there are the... is mechanic called drives, which is basically... Uh, resources that you can expend and replenish during a session. So that's your ability to push yourself behind your standard capacity. So if you um, spend one drive point, you get to roll an additional die. Um, and you can spend as many of those as you want. You could spend all of them on one roll if you need to, but you're just, you lose all your drive points, right? So for example, uh, here in the in the guide, it says if you're rolling with move, uh, you can spend as many points in nerve to add additional dice. Uh, your dice pool can never have more than six dice. So that's good to know. You can't. You're maxed out at six dice. Um, all drives have a maximum. So they want you to have. So they hold. Sorry. So they want you to have nine. Did it say nine in the beginning? They want you to have nine dice, but your pool can't be larger than six when you roll. That's correct. Um, it okay. Not sure if there's a reason for nine other than uh, being able to maybe share dice with other people at the table, so you can provide because uh, you can give other people uh, dice as well. So maybe that's it. Gotcha. Um, gotcha. Gotcha. I, I don't know. That's it's a good question. So um, so yeah, you, your dice pool can never have more than six dice. All drives have a maximum, which determines the highest amount of points your character can have in that drive. Your sheet also displays that amount that's currently available, which is the number that will decrease as you spend them. So um, another player can also assist you. This is where this comes in by using one of their own drive points to give you an extra dice that you can roll during that time. And you can only spend one point of drive per roll. Multiple players could chip in. So like, even though you can use only use one of those dice. If you get the rest of the people in your circle to help you, then you can chip in and fill out your dice pool of six if, if needed. So, um, yeah, but it also is up to the GM's discretion of whether or not your circle members are able to help. So narratively, what are they doing to help when they give right. you that dice, right? Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so that's, that's kind of nice. And then there's also these things called um, uh, gilded actions. So if, an action is marked as gilded, uh, so this is based on your character, um, then you can always replace a standard die with a gilded die when you roll. So um, usually you use a different color, I guess, and if you choose the result on that die, you get a point back. Now, you don't have to, like, let's say you roll three dice, one of them are, is gilded, and you get a six, a five, and a three and the gilded one had the three you could choose the three because you want your point back right like right. that's you know it's it if you really want to do that so um you can recoup 
uh, what you need to. So it's it's interesting how you do this from a narrative perspective. But you can choose the gilded. That's what it says. Uh, gilded die with with the goal of recovering a drive point, even if the result is lower than the one of a standard die roll in your dice pool. Um, then there are resistances. Uh, so this is a way of pushing back against a consequence. So anytime you don't like the result of your roll, you can choose to spend a resistance from that pertaining drive. You can have one resistance for maximum of uh, for, no, you can have one resistance per three maximum drive. So uh, the resistance does not go away if you spend your drive points. For example, if your maximum drive is four and you spent three drive, you now have one. So you have you still have your one resistance left. So after you spend a resistance, you can re-roll the number of dice equal to the rating for the action. So it gives you a chance to kind of re-roll stuff if you're not uh, happy with it, but you have to spend your resistance to do that. So a good example here. Carlos has one point in strike and spends two points in nerve to roll three dice. His highest result in the pool is three, so he decides to spend a nerve resistance to re-roll. Because he has only one point in strike, he re-rolls one die. The new result is a four. It's a mixed success instead of a miss. And so let me jump back over to the pregen so you can kind of see how this works. So we've got um, you've got the nerve uh, cunning intuition things under nerve or things like move strike and control under cunning you've got sway read and hide and intuition you've got survey focus and sense so um, each one of these you can see in the black bar at the top you've got drives that are there and so you can uh, mark them off or I think erase them depending on how you want to spend them and then uh, your character sheet will also tell you uh, additional information. Oh, you've got your resistance underneath here as well, right? So you've got your resistance that would be marked um, under each one. So you can tell this scholar, which we'll learn more about the classes. They've got uh, one under control, two under sway, three or one under read, um, two under survey, two under focus, one in sense. So those are the dice they would use in their uh, dice pool. They also have the diamond uh, marked there. So that's your gilded. You can use your gilded there. Um, you've also got a bunch of other uh, specialties um, marked um, as well. So it's it's really kind of intuitive. Once you understand the, the system and how it works, you kind of mark off your drives when you use them to add to your dice pool. You can use your resistances if you need to re-roll things. Uh, and then underneath each one of these uh, abilities over here, it tells you how much you roll normally. So that's kind of how it works. This, in this, for example, this uh, this scholar um, professor has nothing in move. So anytime you'd have to roll a move roll uh, for some reason, he'd have to roll two and take the lower of the two, right? So that's kind of how it works. Um, so yeah, so let's pause there. Let's head back over to chat. So yeah, I mean pretty straightforward it's there's still i'm sure it's confusing to those who have never played any game like this a little bit you get used to it but i just i, I like the fact that like this quick start guide has basically the rules for this is how the game works and it doesn't take chapters upon chapters upon chapters to to get it down you just figure out this right. short set of rules and you can play well and if you have one person who knows how to play it's not super time consuming to help the people around you too. You know, there's so much yeah. less information that you kind of have to wade through. You just have to kind of shift gears in your mind. You know, like for me going over that and reading that, like the resistances are a little bit um, confusing to me. I mean, does that mean that you didn't really like the, the, the role and you're choosing to challenge it pretty much by trying to roll again but you get a very small amount of dice it's and then it, you like have to, to take that number or do you have to take whatever number total that you you know can you go back and take one of your old numbers that wasn't that great but it's still better than the one you rolled or do you have to take the resistance roll that's a good question i don't know i'll have to go back and, and look to see how that works i think it's basically like you're getting a chance to roll with advantage basically but you have to spend a point to do that it's almost like um in in 5e there's there's a luck point system 
where you have a certain amount of points and you can use it to basically roll your 20 again. You burn it and then you can roll a 20 again and then you only have a certain amount that you can use for that d20 roll. Um, when you get rid of all your luck, you're done. You can't do that anymore. It's almost like that where you can kind of spend a point to roll with it. I, I think it's with advantage, like you take the better of the of the two. But um, right. that, that's a good okay. question. We'll have cool. to look at the guide to see. Yeah. Yeah. And then I think it's important to kind of reiterate you said it. But um, one of the things that I, I, I was questioning about were the gilded die and on the character sheet, where you can have you don't get a gilded die for every single one but where you have them is where that little diamond is kind of bubbled in next to that um action you can take so to speak uh then that yeah. that's the the one that you can use like in there on the control that diamond is colored in so you can use a gilded die on it yeah it it's says, almost like proficiency uh, i guess right fill diamond left of the action yeah yeah so you fill in if you have control yes that's right you could use a gilded die there as well if you choose to yep okay i think it'll 100%. be it would be fun yeah. to try definitely i mean it was fun watching them I think play so too. um so I, I, and then the the little the little sheet with the the three longer uh, rectangles and then the three short little squares. Um, can you explain that to me? Like what are the longer ones and what are the shorter ones? Yeah, no, great question. So here's what I think it is. I'm pretty sure this is how it works. The little squares underneath, I think it's so that you know what your max is. Okay. And then like, so like right now he's got, or she has one, two, three, four of uh, the six drive points that he has because he's erased or she's erased two of them the what like if you think of the blue as being uh you know taking keeping track of how many drives i have like you erase the ones on the top and i think the ones at the bottom are so you remember this is how many your max was it's just kind of letting yeah, you know okay. what your total yeah. is um okay uh, like it's almost like your bottom is the is the ammunition <laughs> and and like every time you right. take a shot you got one out you know um i'm pretty sure okay. that's how it's used otherwise you're erasing and marking so many times it's like you don't want to erase something and go oh how many did i have to start with like if you do something that right. replenishes them you can replenish back up to what you had full gotcha, that's a good question gotcha. yeah okay yeah so um so then there's also like uh some other things that are are again um related to the role play of this but you can also use these from a mechanical perspective as well so connections gears and and connection gear and marks so the connections are the bonds that you establish between characters um during character creation so that you've got some things that you're setting there we only know what's available on the pre-gens now, so hopefully we'll know more as they release stuff. It's actually, well, here you go. It says in the full game, there's a defined method for building relationships, but you know we've got the ones that are just listed on the pre-gens for now. Um, and then for each assignment, you choose gear from the available list um, the moment it's needed. You don't need to pre-select all the stuff before you begin. So you basically say, here's the stuff on the list, I'm going to use this <laughs> like, and you're just assuming that um, you can choose up to three pieces of gear during your assignment. So it's basically giving you a list of things that you could have brought with you. And in the moment you're deciding, oh yeah, I brought this with me and you can do that for three, <laughs> three things. Right. So that's a really that's elegant nice. way of handling like here, I brought the right stuff I needed without having to say I brought everything I needed because if you use yeah. all three, then you can't say, oh, I brought this. And like, no, 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 you already brought these three things. You can't pick another one, which I think is it's, it's nice that you're doing that. Um, there's also a blank space that you can utilize to take something significant. So um, if you had a specific thing that you knew you actually wanted to take, an artifact, weapon, some other thing that the, um, you know, the Order or the Candela Obscura wants you to take with you, you can write that in. Um, anytime damage is taken, it's tracked using what they call marks. And so you take a mark in one of three areas. Uh, so there's a body, brain, and bleed. So body is physical harm. The brain is any type of mental, emotional, strain, stress type of things. And then bleed, all of that damage is what's uh, caused to you by magic. 
And so you can get up to three marks in each category. If you ever need to take three marks, then it becomes a scar. So you erase it and it becomes a scar. And that re represents permanent damage that you take. And it varies like the what it is based on the type of scar that you take. So uh, if it's a, a good example here, and I think they give some more examples on the next one, but a good example is if it's body, you might end up with a limp or a missing eye. If it's brain, you might get um, this need to be withdrawn from people. If it's bleed, maybe you're always uh, <laughs> dripping with black ichor or your body grows luminous tendrils or whatever like you know anything that's like all magical myst mysterious and um i think you as the player get a voice in what that is like you explain this is how i'm scarred right so uh, it's, it's very interesting um but then you also have to re have to remove a point of action of your choice from one area and move it to a different action so um again Let's look at the pregens. If this person was to take the scar, maybe they would take something away from control and put it in hide or something. Because maybe it was a brain thing and they are like, they're like, ah, they're more skittish now and they want to move it. And they would just explain, that's why I want to be able to hide better uh, based on that. But it's a, it's a permanent change to your character based on what that's i really like that mechanic a lot um yeah that's cool there are also circle mechanics so this is another great thing about this is you it's really emphasizing the team the circle um so at character creation you choose a circle name so you choose it's your team name right basically you, you turn uh, choose your name and your ability and then after each assignment um you have uh, the the GM is going to ask you three illumination questions. And so if you answer yes for each one of these or in the affirmative for each one of those, then you gain a point of illumination. So if you fulfilled one of your illumination, illumination keys, you get a point. Um, and so this gives you a chance as a group to sort of gain some things. It's almost like this is how character progression works. You complete assignments, you answer questions, and then you can sort of uh, Mac, uh, also keep track of your milestones. This works, I'll, I'll switch over to the circle sheet. So you can see like the um, illumination questions. Did you uh, contain or destroy a source of bleed? Did you provide <laughs> comfort or support to those affected? Uh, did you bring something of importance back for Candela Obscura? So you earn two illumination, uh, illumination if some, but not all of the players fulfilled one of these keys. Earn four if every player got one of those. And then you have these points that you can use for certain things. You also like get a chance for advancement. So when the, the illumination track is filled, so you move around this circular almost clock-like thing, right? Bubbling stuff in um, along the track. Uh, when the track is full, any other illumination counters towards your next advancement cycle. So when your character advance, you get to add an action point, add uh, two drive points, take a new ability, and... Uh, sorry, what was... That's... Uh, oh, guild an additional action so you have another gilded oh, cool. action that you can use which is nice um and then you have some things here that you get from resources from a candela obscura perspective stitch refresh and uh train this step was cool and to so, me yeah so this is it really interesting like and, and it gets into um to this here where it says you can if you use a stitch you heal all of one player's marks uh refresh uh fill in all of one player's drives and resistances and train you get a bonus die that you can add on any roll during the next session which again because there's no adding of pluses and minuses here an extra die is a really important thing right you can add to that dice pool um so really really fun way of handling that i'm gonna move to the next page but then stop because i want to make sure that um oh oh i don't want to stop yet so there is a, a sort of a thing here where um you know, they, a few warnings about the whole role-playing game and insanity for all you Cthulhu fans. They just have a different take on it. Um, 
And then they give some examples for like body scars, brain scars, and bleed scars, just to make sure that um, keep it in in perspective. Just again, they kind of mention it here. Above all, make choices that facilitate the story while keeping the well-being of your fellow players in mind. Uh, you know, best explore the world, magic and monsters, and build and play characters prioritizing specifically humanity and compassion. So let's not make a make a game too much out of mental illness, right? Is what they're trying to say. Like, have it be fun, have it yeah. be something that's have compassion. There, but let's, yeah, yeah, let's not make light of certain things that are real in the real world. So just stay on tone okay. and not tone deaf. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, yeah. So, all right. So that was a bunch. Uh, <laughs> thoughts on all yeah. the rest of that so um i really like like i was saying earlier i, I like that they have a survey at the end you know it's like <laughs> you've now finished your mission let's sit down yeah. to review your progress <laughs> um i really like that for how much positivity or much, not really positivity, but how much like forward in the mission that they've gotten that it can directly, they directly get things back to kind of help the group. And it's just a, a, a whole pool for the whole group to use. Yeah. And so after you finish a mission, you get so many resist or you get so many um, stitches, you get so many, I, I can't remember the other, the, um, was it resolve? No, it was refresh. And then um, the third one, what was the third one? Uh, stitch, train. refresh, and train. Yep. Yeah. So I like that, like, it's very specified too. Like, okay, you get three stitches back because of this action, these actions, you get like two refreshes, you might get one train, you know, you might, and it all depends on like the group cohesively completing certain things. And when you've completed that mission, that's how many you have. But that's just for that mission. So you don't know if you're supposed to hang on to them, right? You know, hold on. Like, because when you get done with your next mission, you're going to go through this all over again and you might not get any new stitches or refreshes or trains. So you have to really spin them very wisely. You know, if you've only got like one bleed or whatever, you don't want to use a refresh. Yeah. You want to wait till you're about to take a scar unless you willingly want your character to take a scar so that there's like, you know, character progression and development that goes. But the only way to wipe those off, you don't go to rest and they go away. They stay from, um, you know, like mission to mission. And so the only way to wipe those away are to use a stitch, a refresh, a train. So... And I think I think that's I'm, really I'm important right, to kind of like keep in mind too. Only, yeah, no, that you're 100. percent Like, and I think because it's a pool and you're doing it as a group, you have to be you have to think through who needs what. Because I think if I'm reading this right, it says in each of the following resources, fill out the sections top and bottom equal to the number of your circle members plus one. Between assignments, each player may spend up to two resources of their choosing. So what I take from that. Oh, it's, and then it says when resources are used only erase the top section. So it just lets them know how many is available. But what that tells me is you can't use these during session. You have to use them like in between sessions too. So it's not like you right. can say, Oh, I want to use this. You're not like I, I can pop hurt. a potion. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. You're not like, which is, Oh, which makes really sense, quick. I got to right? sit because... over in this corner and get <laughs> stitched up by someone exactly. or, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, because you can't immediately train in the middle of like, you know, you're, I'm going into this bookstore. Let me just train. Like, no, you got to go get the books, take them home, read them, do whatever you got to yeah. do. Right? Like, you're not playing if, a video game, you know, yeah. <laughs> so it's, you don't it's get really, the pop up screen really that halts everything. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I, I, I so think you're right. It, it is cool. It's a good, yeah, a good way to handle it. Um, I want to go too deep into this, but I, I love that they provide more information. We're coming up on an hour. So um, I'll let you guys, I'll put a link in the description to uh, this so that you can check it out. I'm sure if you're a fan, you've already got this uh, link available, but I'll put a link there. But this gives you information on the setting. It talks about the Fairlands, the last great war, the language, um, the city that this is all happening in. Um, uh, and then also like, uh, you know, some of the power systems that are here, the triumvirate, the old fair, 
um, lighthouse. This, uh, the lighthouses are something that's really interesting to me too. It's as Candela Obscura, a verb, uh, a Candela Obscura evolved during the ages, uh, they attempted to find and secure the effects of the bleed. So the investigator discovered thinnings. They built lighthouses containing magical astrolabes at each site to hold back the deadly forces. So it was almost like once they found a place where it was thinning, they figured out, let me put a lighthouse there to stop the things from coming through in this thin right. area, which is really cool to me. Um, so uh, they're also bleed infested, uh, <laughs> you know, and so they can be across the whole landscape. And so um it's sort of a reminder of uh, failure to them because it's been, you know, these are ancient at this point. And um, yeah, so both ancient and recently constructed, these bleed infested lighthouses are found across the Halen landscape for Candela Obscura members. They offer an ominous reminder of the ramifications of failure for new fair citizens. They've become a pinnacle of local mythos and warn of the vulnerable away from danger. So yeah, interesting stuff. Um, I also love that they've got uh, otherware as uh, you got new fairings and then the otherware they use this name for the country across the sea so you're here and otherware I love it um, <laughs> districts of new fair uh, then they get into a little bit more detail you know we've got a map and got some landmarks um, they talk about the organization in general we, we talked about some of this stuff early on some notable figures uh, within the organization other organizations, um, the es uh, Exoteric Order of New Sciences, Eons, uh, is one of them. We've got the Office of Unexplained uh, Phenomena, which the OUP is sort of, um, I, it's almost like, I feel like a, a rival in some ways to Candela Obscura. So um, maybe I'm reading that wrong, but I are you know, I, I think that's sort of a, a way that you could look at it in some aspects. So um, then you've got this, uh, you know, a great adventure that if you guys want to try it, um, Dress to Kill, so that kind of goes through, gives a hook, the arrival, exploration. It's just, it's really well put together to kind of explain how this uh, works from a game perspective. So, um, and I also love the fact that even in this quick start, they've got really good, you know, little art and, and handwritten notes. I did notice this was actually really funny to me. I'm going to go back to one of the earlier pages here. Uh, here we go. So there was a, um, there were two releases of this. There was one that came out and I think the day or two later, they released another version of this packet. They, they made a change. What was funny is uh, they made the change and then they wrote in here, um, spelling error. Are you sure you're okay to be back so quickly? I'm worried about you. I'm fine. Thank you for the, for the catch. And like they wrote on it to show the spelling area with the two D's and damage. So, um, I thought it's just a good touch for how this all kind of comes together. So, um, yeah, so just overall, I mean, that was kind of, it's, it's interesting yeah. kind of looking at the quick start guide, seeing how they put the game together really enjoyed the first session it was different watching it then i have more insight after going through all the rules i understand a lot of what was going on a little bit better now yeah um, i was totally clueless watching it i was like yeah we're gonna yeah. watch this it's gonna be cool i'm like what are, what's what's going on yeah. <laughs> what's a drive <laughs> yeah. so so next game it wasn't hard <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, but it wasn't hard once it started going like you it's a very yeah. simplified you know, system. So I yeah. was confused at first, but once they got going, I was like, Oh, okay. I told, yeah, I get it now. Okay. All yeah. right. So, which says a lot, like, you know, if you can do that with a show and, and it, it you know, like from a business perspective, cause you know, they are a, a company too. Like they're, they've got course. their, you know, so they are for um, profit. <laughs> yeah. It's, I mean, let's, I give them credit for being like riding that line of being artists and creators but also they are paying for their light bill and their mortgages and their family right. and all this stuff. They got, but they're also money. doing things and very morally right too, you know, yes. like they're, they're yeah. a group, they're a good group. They're a good bunch. I, I agree. So far, I've been so kind good. of feel, I've, yeah. yeah, I felt like 
it's kind of murder mystery ish, you know, like it gives me yeah. that like, like vibe of it being like some like, Oh, what's happening now. And yeah, you know, I don't like the dark and the gloomy and the kind of the, you never know, you turn the corner and there's something right there, you know, I, I and I like that. So I, I think it would be really interesting to, to, to play a game. After and we also, watch like, a couple more little. Well, I, I also feel like the system itself, like once you get a feel for this, you could take it and do all kinds of different, they could make this into a Western. They could make this into. Um, oh yeah. A completely different genre. They could do a samurai genre if they wanted to with this. Like there's a lot right. of different things that you could do Ooh. to with the system and, and, you know, use the rule set for this. So the fact that they're able right. to play and they've got really good people, um, you know, playing the characters and the role play is on point and the system comes across through that um, is really interesting. Now, this is someone I like, there may be other, you know, others of you out there that are like, uh, I didn't like the system. It wasn't for me. And that's totally fine too. Like, um, or you might find that other D six systems do it better for you. That's great too. Like, I don't think there's a right or wrong here. It's just a, a, a preference. Um, you know, it's, it's more. Well, and I, I, I'm also of the mind that anything that's different can be, there could be pushback to it, you know, anything that's sure. confusing or anything that's different. But like, I feel like change is difficult for humans, you know? Yeah. Um, and when you spend so much time immersed in one mechanic, seeing something like this, like it is really different. And that, at least that's how I felt about it. Like I was looking at, I'm like, I was trying to make it more complicated. Like, I'm like, but that's all it is. Like, where's the more of their sheet? Like, where's more of their stuff? Like what's, I don't, okay. That's all. That's it. You're only rolling sixes, six siders. Um, you know, like I'm so used to have like, I, whenever I create a character, whenever I'm playing a game, I do a deep dive. I'm like, I'm, you know, I'm writing pages of stuff. I'm like fleshing my character out and doing all these roles and doing all these things and, and um, trying to make sure that I've got the mechanics down, which is so hard when you've got so many things to choose from, because I like to play a Druid and let's be honest, a Druid or a cleric or something, you know, something that's magical. And it's like, how do I even figure out this magical stuff? Well, I figured that out and it's this hard, but I got it. And then you take you back, hey, take me backwards and watch something like this. And I'm like that, that's it mechanically, you know, like, Oh, well, that's easy. Okay. You know, so I, I feel like I'm not a big resistor to change in a lot of ways. Like I like fun, interesting new things. So I definitely would give it a try, but I could yeah. see where people would be like, Oh, I don't know. I don't know if I like that. Yeah. You know, I also, yeah, <laughs> no, I get it. But I also think it's like, um, if, having played D and D since I was a kid, like, I played more D and D than any other role playing game, but I have played other role playing games, um, and so I have some experience with that. A lot of people that got into role playing games have only played D and D uh, tabletop games, right? So I think um, what's good about this is it's showing people that hey, there's nothing wrong with playing D and D. There's nothing wrong with Five E. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with Pathfinder. You play whatever you want to play, um, but these are some other games that you can also play. And have fun too, right? right? It's it, this you know, isn't a replacement um, for five E. Exactly. You know, like this, yeah. this is a total different system. It's its own kit and caboodle. You know, yeah. like it's not something where you're going to go, oh, that's better because it's like apples and oranges. You know, it's not. Yeah. Only it, the only reason why I compare is just for my experience right. level. You know, hundred um, percent. Because all I, I, I have ever played is is tried and true 5e and then a, an abbreviated version of 5e when we do guardians of Gettica things you know so yep. i have this is the only experience i have with another system other than reading through uh, blades of um oh what blades, blades of what was it blades in the dark and that was very like that was my first introduction to a system similar to this reading it and going through the book and finding it fascinating and then then watching this in play so I think it's cool. No, and I think that's that's my point. Like, I think it's you're a perfect example of someone that's like, uh, it's not that you don't understand all the different types of things, and you've been involved in the 
the genre for even before you started playing 5e and D and stuff. Oh, yeah. It's just, um, there are some people that just don't want to try a new thing. Uh, and I think it's, it's fun to be able to see something that you're familiar with played or, or people that you're familiar with playing a game, doing something a little different. And, uh, right. the fact that they've released this as a game and they've also got another one coming out. Um, so if they've got dagger heart, they're going to release, I think that's going to be bigger. I think it's going to be more like a D20 system, more like 5e. Um, you know, I would not, it would not surprise me if eventually, because they're, they're playtesting both uh, systems, um, if eventually their main campaign switched over to their new game. And I wouldn't, wouldn't bother me one bit. I, I think it's, no. uh, it's, it's I fun think that's where to, they're headed. to kind of try out new stuff. So uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, but yeah, I'm excited to see all the new stuff that they're putting out. I'm excited that more people are learning about other games besides D and D. Uh, I think it's good for the hobby in general, different companies make different games and people mm-hmm. can go out and play different things. So I think it's good stuff. Well, then so. we can support other people's imagination you know it's like it's not just railroaded into this one little corner it's let's shine the light on these different things maybe it's not for you but it's still fun and it still would be fun to try you know and you could at least say you tried it i like the fact that things are broadening you know it's it's there's definitely a lot more i think um talk about different settings yeah. and different role play playing you know um systems and things like that versus everything being strictly 5e i like 5e but again somebody coming in that's the the best version that they've come up with this the easiest one for like a beginner it's still really complicated in some ways you know so yeah. yes so if you're gonna ease somebody into sitting down at a table and playing a role playing game it's not so hard to say hey you got six or however many six siders, you know, these are the abbreviated little things you get to do. Yeah. Let's play. So it, it's, it's a little bit easier, you know, I think a little so bit better, I think easier to plug and play. And, and uh, again, it's not a replacement. There's, there's uh, all kinds of rooms yeah. for different things. So awesome. Yes. All right. Well, we will see everybody uh, tomorrow when we talk about the latest uh, episode of campaign three back to five E we'll be talking about that system again, but um, <laughs> yeah, looking forward to it. Um, everybody have yes. a wonderful evening and we bells hell next time. <laughs> That's right. Back to bells. Hells. All right, everybody. Bye. Bye.